I'm glad to see all of you. Welcome to those who are joining you, joining us online. We're thrilled that you're here. A special welcome to members of our neighboring faiths class in our junior high and high school ages. We're glad that you are here to attend our worship service this morning. And a very special welcome to all of our guests. We are delighted that you chose to spend some time with us this morning. And we'd love it if you'd stop and introduce yourself in our fellowship hall at the welcome table. Let us get to know you and introduce ourselves to you as well. I have a few announcements as we begin. It's a super busy time at our church, and I want you to know about the important things that are coming up. First is our annual auction. This is a big social event for our church as well as a fundraiser, and we want everybody to come. Um, Folks in Elliott Hall right outside here can help you get registered and help you make your donation for your tickets. We're still looking for some folks to sponsor tables and to donate some items for the live auction. Um, These can be as big and grand as uh, vacation home, or it can be as small as jewelry that you make by hand, um, and everything in between. And I think if you've been to our auction before, you, you know that we have quite a wide variety of things available in the live auction. So we're still looking for some of those donations. Um, we want everybody to be able to come to our auction. And so if this is your first time attending, uh, you, we're asking for half price donation for your ticket so that you can so that you can come and there's also free child care at the church so you can sign up and get your tickets at the table in Elliott Hall next Sunday it's spooky season and it's one of my favorite Sundays when we have our trunk or treat for all of our small people and people who just can't resist the candy I know I know, you can't. If you have small people, uh, or if you'd like to uh, decorate your trunk and give out some candy, we're going to do it in the back parking lot after the 11 o'clock worship service. However, if you're not involved in trunk or treat, and you've parked back there, you have till 1215 to move your car, or else we're going to put a costume on you. I'm serious. We close the parking lot at 12.15 so we can have a safe environment for our kiddos. And if you haven't moved, well, you're just stuck. And last year, a couple people did get stuck. So (laughs) you got to take us seriously on this, okay? Uh, We have just a couple of spots remaining on our excursion to southern Idaho, Saturday, November 4th, to help plant trees on the Bear River with our Shoshone neighbors. For more information, again, you can stop at the table in Elliott Hall. Um, We are headed up there um, to plant those trees, and there's just maybe two or three spots left. So we want you to jump on that if you haven't already. Finally, some information about classes. We have our newcomer orientation that's coming up November 2nd, 9th, and 16th. It's on Zoom, and it's for anyone who's interested in joining our church who's new to Unitarian Universalism, or if you just want to find out what this faith is, come to this class and they'll answer your questions. It's held on Zoom, and it's facilitated by Bill and Christine Ashworth. Then next Sunday after the 11 o'clock service, if you're not trunk-or-treating, I invite you to join me for a discussion about anti-Semitism, what it is, how we can recognize it, how we can help our Jewish neighbors feel safer in their communities. The discussion is based on the book, We Need to Talk About Anti-Semitism, by Rabbi Diana Fursco, and I'm asking folks to please read the book ahead of time so we can have a productive discussion together. And then finally, starting tomorrow evening at 7 o'clock, I'm offering a three-week class called Resisting Fascism. It's based on the work of UU scholar Reverend Cecilia Kingman and scholars Timothy Snyder and Jason Stanley. You can register for this class or the newcomer class via links that you'll find in our Torch email newsletter or on our website. The book discussion, no need to register, just read the book and show up with an open heart. Now, take a breath, locate our bodies in time and space, prepare ourselves for worship. This morning I bring a chalice lighting 
written by Carl Sagan. The size and age of the cosmos are beyond ordinary human understanding, lost somewhere between immensity and eternity is our tiny planetary home. In a cosmic perspective, most human concerns seem insignificant, even petty, and yet our species is young and curious and brave and shows much promise. In the last few millennia, we have made the most astonishing and unexpected discoveries about the cosmos and our place within it explorations that are exhilarating to consider. They remind us that humans have evolved to wonder, that understanding is a joy, that knowledge is prerequisite to survival. I believe our future depends on how well we know this cosmos in which we float like a mote of dust in the morning sky. I'm going to turn it over to our music director, David Owens, for our opening hymn. Oh boy, we didn't learn anything. Not too difficult. It's actually hymn number 1003 in the turquoise hymnal. You don't need any less to think to do when you can use it. What we're going to do is kind of divide the room up. All right? This side, over here at the south side pews, will be with this side of the choir. Okay, so you got helpers there. This side, with that side of the choir. You folks out there are with the basses, right along here. All right, and if we get it going, Monica, Reverend Jay, and I might come in on the fourth part. <laughs> there it is. Where do we come from? What are we? Where are we going? Where do we come from? What are we? Where are we going? That's all there is to it. And you just keep doing that. Okay? <laughs> this side. These whole notes get two great big beats. Where Where do we come from? 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 Where
Sometimes I like to tell my teenagers stories about the good old days, back before the internet, when we had to talk to each other on phones that were wired to the wall and your mom could pick up the handset in another room and hear everything you were saying. And we only had four channels on the TV, and at least three of them were pretty much the same. Cartoons in the morning, soap operas in the afternoon, local news at five, and your choice of Jennings, rather, or Brokaw at six. We watched Jennings, I don't know why, but that was who we watched. After the news was Wheel of Fortune, followed by Jeopardy, and then the sitcoms that were deemed too grown up for us kids to watch, and the late night shows that were definitely too grown up. But there was a fourth channel, PBS, where Sesame Street and Mr. Rogers taught us about how to live in a neighborhood. And Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom taught us about the natural world. We especially loved the episodes where lions chased their prey across the savanna. And sometimes my dad would turn it on to watch Nova and my favorite, Cosmos with the astronomer Carl Sagan. For those who don't remember, Cosmos was a television show in which Sagan traveled through space and time in a ship of the imagination, a 1980s special effects masterpiece, to explore galaxies and visit the great scientists of history and just marvel at how amazing the universe is he talked about science in a very personal way, weaving his own stories into the stories of scientific history. Nowadays, I'm sort of amazed that I got to watch Cosmos, considering that Sagan was a well-known atheist and my family were Christian fundamentalists. But my dad enjoyed learning about science, and so did I. I didn't know anything about Sagan's beliefs. I just knew that he was fascinated by the universe. The thrill of discovery was evident in his expressions. Sagan also loved books, and I loved books more than anything in the world. Elsewhere, he would say that science is not only compatible with spirituality, it is a profound source of spirituality. The notion that science and spirituality are somehow mutually exclusive does a disservice to both. I always felt that way too. It's been a long time since I brought you just a reading on a Sunday morning, but when I thought about this morning's topic of fear and awe, Carl Sagan came persistently to mind. So please hear these words that might be familiar to you, words that capture for me the sense of awe that Sagan and so many other deeply spiritual scientists inspire. He invites us to imagine planet Earth as seen from the Voyager 1 space probe as it passes by the planet Saturn and turns to get a glimpse of home. Look again at that dot. That's here. That's home. That's us. On it, everyone you love, everyone you know, everyone you ever heard of, every human being who ever was, lived out their lives. The aggregate of our joy and suffering Thousands of confident religions, ideologies, and economic doctrines, every hunter and forager, every hero and coward, every creator and destroyer of civilization, every king and peasant, every young couple in love, 
Every mother and father, hopeful child, inventor and explorer, every teacher of morals, every corrupt politician, every superstar, every supreme leader, every saint and sinner in history lived there on a moat of dust suspended in a sunbeam. The earth is a very small stage in a vast cosmic arena. Think of the endless cruelties visited by the inhabitants of one corner of this pixel on the scarcely scarcely distinguishable inhabitants of some other corner. How frequent their misunderstandings, how eager they are to kill one another, how fervent their hatreds. Think of the rivers of blood spilled by these generals and emperors so that in glory and triumph they can become the momentary masters of a fraction of a dot. Our posturings, our imagined self-importance, the delusion that we have some privileged position in the universe are challenged by this point of pale light. Our planet is a lonely speck in the great enveloping cosmic dark. In our obscurity, in all this vastness, there is no hint that help will come from elsewhere to save us from ourselves. The earth is the only world known so far to harbor life. There's nowhere else, at least in the near future, to which our species could migrate. Visit? Yes. Settle? Not yet. Like it or not, for the moment, the earth is where we make our stand. There is perhaps no better demonstration of the folly of human conceits than this distant image of our tiny world. To me, it underscores our responsibility to deal more kindly with one another and to preserve and cherish the pale blue dot, the only home we've ever known.
Oh, we give thanks. Oh, we give thanks for this precious day. For this precious day. For all gathered here. For all gathered here. And those far away. And those far away. For this time we share. For this time we share. With love and care. With love and care. Oh, we give thanks. Oh, we give thanks for this precious day. I am giving thanks for this precious day, for each of you, for the beautiful music from our choir, our lovely choir, and for this place that encourages free inquiry and exploration and awe, all of that in our spirituality and gratitude. At this time, we pause to encourage generosity from the folks who are here, from our members and friends, uh, time to give to this place that saves all of that sort of awe for our community. I encourage you to give generously if you're able and to take this time to greet one another. Good morning. Welcome. Glad you're here.
I come from theater. We clap when things are awesome. So. <laughs> <clears throat> so, uh, I'm not sure if everybody knows this, but right before I moved here to be your new senior minister, I was living in Texas, uh, Houston, to be exact. Now, I don't know how much y'all know about Houston and the surrounding areas, but it is not what I would call a beautiful place to live. <laughs> um... It, you know, the bayou has a certain charm, but other than that, it is just flat. And because of the Texan prerogative to expand, 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 these cities all sprawl out and stretch out for miles and miles in all directions. They call it a concrete jungle, but jungles, by definition, are interesting to look at. <laughs> Texas cities and suburbs are all highways or high-rises or strip malls or subdivisions. And in many ways, this reminded me of where I grew up in Indiana. Only bigger, right? Because the stereotype about Texas is true. <laughs> Everything is bigger. The earth was flat and the cities just sprawled on horizontally as far as the eye could see. Now, the thing about these types of cities is when you're on the ground at any given point, everything you see was made for humans, right? The rooms are human-sized and optimized for humans. Streets and neighborhoods are car-sized and optimized for humans. Even green spaces exist in the form of yards or parks, human-centric, human-sculpted, human-owned. With these cities, there is no topography to remind you that humans did not create everything for our own convenience. I suppose this is comforting in a way. After all, it is designed to be comfortable for us, right? But for the 13 years in between Indiana and Texas, I lived in Boston, in Massachusetts. Now, like any city, Boston has the tendency to close people off in their little constructed world, right? In Boston, we did spend the majority of our time in these human-sized rooms, moving between them and our human-optimized cars or on human-catering streets. The trees were strategically planted for us. The sky was just a background for the skyline. But the thing is, Boston was on the ocean. And the ocean, let's be real, does not give a flying fish about us. <laughs> this was a good reminder. Whenever I was a little too wrapped up in my human drama, Whenever politics seemed hopeless, or my work seemed meaningless, or I felt just a little too correct about things, I could just hop on a train and ride out to the harbor and stare at the vast gray swell and fall of the interconnected web of existence. I loved living next to the ocean for this reason. Next to the ocean, I am inarguably small. To the ocean, I am a source of carbon, and little else, probably. <laughs> and despite the plastic trash island out in the widening gyre of the Pacific, and the Martian aspirations of certain billionaire kings, I believe that the chances we will outlast the ocean are vanishingly small. <laughs> now, I don't know about you, but it helps me to be reminded that I am not the biggest and most important thing in the universe. Of course, the ocean is not the only thing that reminds me of this. Mountains do a pretty good job as well. When I was younger, coming from Indiana, I rode on the California Zephyr through the Colorado Rockies, my mouth wide open in the observation car from dawn till dusk. I've seen Mount Fuji and the Matterhorn, I've been to a mountain in Switzerland where I touched a glacier that had been there since the Ice Age. 
I've bathed in a hot spring in Iceland in a basin surrounded by mountains, completely capped by clouds. I did so much before I became a parent. (laughs) I love him dearly. (laughs) But in my 20s, I vowed I would always try to live near either the ocean or the mountains because I wanted to live by something that made me feel small. Houston didn't quite fit this bill, of course. The Gulf was an hour away, and driving on the highways down there was taking your life in your hands. I know people complain about the traffic here, but you don't know. But Salt Lake City, well, you can't really escape the mountains here, can you? I actually live down in Sandy, where the mountains loom over you. What a different experience from where I grew up. Indiana is one of the flattest states in the country. But where I live now, when I go on a mundane run to Target, the building is visibly dwarfed by the enormous pointy mountains towering over it. I would have to work very hard to focus only on the human-made, human-centric things here. There is nothing more human-made and human-centric than Target. (laughs) But the moment you step outside, Mount Olympus and Twin Peaks are like, well, cute. (laughs) Though I was so excited to live in such a place of natural beauty, when I first moved here, my reaction to the ever-looming mountains surprised me. Honestly, part of me found them to be a little frightening. They were sharp and severe, not gentle and rolling like the hills of the Berkshires in Massachusetts. But after living with them for a while, I don't think that that's the main reason why they frightened me. Unlike Boston, where I could choose when to go out and look at the ocean and meditate on my simultaneous insignificance and indelible connection to all that is, the mountains were just in my face about it all the time. (laughs) I couldn't forget my place in the universe. It was a bruise to my ego. That part of me that wants to know everything that part of me that wants to be the main character in the universe story. The mountains were forcing me to be in constant, low-grade awe of everything that is bigger than me. This was the fear that I was feeling. It was the fear that is also awe. But mountains have always done this to us humans, haven't they? I think about how in the book of Exodus, Moses goes up to a mountaintop to see the face of God. And that mountaintop is not a serene, comforting, Zen monastery type of mountaintop either. It says that on Mount Sinai, there was thunder and lightning and a dense cloud upon the mountain and a very loud blast. And all the people who were in the camp below trembled. It says that Mount Sinai was all in smoke, for Adonai had come down upon it in fire. The smoke rose like the smoke of a kiln, and the whole mountain trembled violently. This is the fear of God. Now, I often hear modern people comment disparagingly about how humans are supposed to fear God in the Hebrew Bible. After all, shouldn't God, whatever it is, be about love and not fear? In good faith, this criticism might stem from valid religious trauma. But at worst, this critique can align with Christian-centric anti-Semitism. Either way, though, it misunderstands what is meant here by fear. Rabbi Alan Liu, who was often called the Zen Rabbi, wrote about the different types of fear in the Hebrew Bible in his book, Be Still and Get Going, A Jewish Meditation Practice for Real Life. He writes that pachad refers to projected or imagined fear, fear of what's going to happen, fear of potential negative outcomes. That's the fear of what if. We might even call this anxiety today. 
And I have a lot to say about anxiety because I have a lot of experience. But today I am more interested in the other type of biblical fear, yara. According to Rabbi Lu, yara is the fear that overcomes us when we suddenly find ourselves ourselves in possession of considerably more energy than we are used to, inhabiting a larger space than we are used to inhabiting. This is the type of fear that the characters in the Hebrew Bible experience in the presence of God. Rabbi Lu expands, the nearness of God to these characters in the Bible is an experience of an intensity, an energy, and a sense of spaciousness that they are not accustomed to, and it occasions a sense of yura, a mixture of fear and awe. A new strength announces itself. A new energy bristles through our body, and we call this bristling fear. For lack of a better term, right? Yura is trying to push us open. The fear we experience at such times is simply our resistance to this opening. When I read Rabbi Lu's words, I think of how I feel when I stand and stare at the mountains. They're an invitation for me to open myself up, to realize that my ego, my body, is not everything. That I am part of something so much bigger than whatever myself is. That that is where the fear and awe comes from for me, because when you truly realize how interdependent we all are, it is impossible to go back to business as usual. In Exodus, when Moses sees the face of the divine on the mountaintop, it changes him. The text says that forever after that, his face shines. Now, some people translate that as he grew horns or he had horns, and that's because of the Hebrew word karen or karen, uh, but Scholars are pretty sure that's not what they were actually talking about. But fun fact, because this translation was so prevalent in early English translations of the Bible, if you go to Rome, you can find a Michelangelo sculpture of Moses that has giant horns. The more you know. <laughs> For me, sitting with the hugeness of the mountains cracks my ego open. It forces me to reorient and seek to serve the world around me rather than just myself. Now, I hope that we can all agree that one does not need to believe in the God of the Hebrew Bible or of any Bible to experience this type of awe and wonder. I think that God or the idea of God is many things. But one of those things is a metaphor for the edge of human understanding. And we will always have that edge. There is a lot that is ineffable about this world, a lot that is ununderstandable. I know that some engineers and others among us might tell me that, oh, we'll get to codifying and quantifying and controlling everything eventually if we last long enough. But consider me a skeptic of that particular brand of faith. <laughs> All we can perceive and measure is filtered through sense organs that evolved particularly to survive on one tiny, insignificant planet in an unfathomably vast cosmos. The lifespan of our entire species is a relative blip in the billions of years since the Big Bang. And every single thing we think we know is a product of something we call consciousness, which our best scientists and philosophers can't even agree on a definition for. We share 98.8% .8 of our DNA with chimpanzees. Think about that. Genetically, we are only a little more than one percentage point away from chimps. Now, many people point to this fact in order to celebrate how much of a difference that one percentage point makes, how much more advanced we are compared to them, even with so much shared DNA. But I tend to align with Neil deGrasse Tyson on the issue. 
He says, and I am paraphrasing, if we are only 1% different from chimpanzees, maybe the difference in our advancement is not quite so great as we think. <laughs> in other words, we don't know what we don't know, right? We think we are wildly advanced because we think that we are as advanced as we have ever been. And when we look around us on Earth, we think that we are the most advanced things on the planet. I'm sure we're not biased at all, right? <laughs> but there could be aliens out there who see in 13 dimensions, who surf on dark matter. To them, they might look, we might look like amoeba. It only took me two months to talk about aliens from the pulpit. <laughs> Think about that. Think about it. You did this. You voted for this. Think about it. Anyway, what I'm saying is, you cannot convince me that we and our little chimpanzee brains and sense organs can figure out everything in the universe and beyond. That is a remarkably anthropocentric view of the universe that we were supposed to have outgrown with the Enlightenment, and yet it persists. Now, I'm not saying that we shouldn't strive to understand all we can, of course. Rather, I am just reminding us that, in my opinion, humanity's natural state should be one of awe, wonder, and humility. If we approached our planet from a place of Yura, that awe that comes at the edge of our egos, how could we continue to abuse her as we have? If we approached our fellow human beings with that sense of awe, wonder at the infinitesimally small likelihood that we would happen to be alive on this earth together in the vastness of space and time, how could we do anything but approach one another with curiosity and gratitude. After three months here, I am less afraid of the mountains, but I am still in awe of them. I hope that never changes. I invite all of us to allow the mountains to make us feel small on a daily basis. If you've lived here long enough that the mountains have become no big deal, a backdrop for your daily routine, I invite you to sit with them for a while on their terms. Allow them to fill you with your raw, that mixture of fear and awe that tries to push us open to be a part of something ever larger, ever more mysterious. May we allow ourselves to be pushed open by the many beautiful mysteries of this world. When a new strength announces itself, when a new energy bristles through our body, may we not try to shut it down, but instead allow ourselves to expand to greet it. May we move forward from that wide open, interconnected place. May it be from that place that we discover how we can best use what we have however small, to serve our community and our world. May it be so. Amen. Please rise in body or spirit for our closing hymn, number 1052 in the Teal Hymnal, The Oneness of Everything.
My friends, this week, I invite us all to seek out one opportunity to feel small. Whether it's meditating with the mountains or staring up at the night sky somewhere where there's less light pollution, uh, or reading about our unfathomable universe, try to take a few moments or a few minutes or an hour to cultivate awe. Let it break you open. And if you do find a little bit of awe, I invite you to try to hold on to it as you interact with family and friends, neighbors, and community. Notice how it changes you and move forward from that place. May it be so. Just remember that you're standing on a planet that's evolving and revolving at 900 miles an hour. Oh no. That's a total at 19 miles a second, so it's reckoned the sun that is the source of all our power. Our power. Now the sun and you and me and all the stars that we can see are moving at a million miles a day. And the outer spiral arm at 40,000 miles an hour Of a galaxy we call the Milky Way Milky Way Our galaxy itself contains a hundred billion stars It's a hundred thousand light years side to side It bulges in the middle, 16,000 light years thick But out by us it's just 3,000 light years wide we're 30,000 light years from galactic central point. We go around every 200 million years. And our galaxy itself is one of billions of billions in this amazing and expanding universe. Our universe itself keeps on expanding and expanding in all of the directions it can whiz. Can whiz. As fast as it can go at the speed of light, you know. A million miles a minute, and that's the fastest speed there is. So remember when you're feeling very small and insecure, how amazingly unlikely is your birth. Your birth. And pray that there's intelligent life somewhere up in space. Cause there's fucker all down here on Earth. Incredible choir and David Owens bringing us some Monty Python to close out our morning. Thank you all so much. Friends, I hope you will join us for coffee uh, in Elliott Hall. Sign up to go plant trees with the Shoshone. Uh, sign up for our uh, auction dinner. It's going to be great fun, and I'd love to talk to you. I'm sure everybody else would too. Go forth. <laughs>